Good morning, Charles. Hey, Gwen. <clears throat> How Hi. are you? Well, if I can talk, I'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we want you to talk today. I guess. Yeah. That, that might be a that might be a good thing, right? Yeah, it might be. <laughs> you know, for somebody kind of, you know, basically, you know, facilitating a class, yeah, being able to talk would be, you know, probably a great idea. <laughs> Either that or you have to type a lot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Let's not do that. You know. Okay. <laughs> I I have issues with uh you know basically my computer and, and predictive text. You know, <laughs> so you end up saying things you didn't really mean to say, <laughs> right? Yeah, you know, it's like I uh, hate that. <laughs> yeah, it, you know, it's like I'll be doing a uh, a posting in uh, yeah book, right? And uh -huh. you know, just kind of you know typing along, everything's fine, you know, and uh, you know, I get to the end of it, and you know, I I read back through it and without, what the heck? where did that come from <laughs> yeah without without fail there's usually like two or three words in there it's like you know. hey, that's not right you know yeah where it just like it thought i was going to say a particular thing you know not and it, <clears throat> <laughs> and it ends up in the bob, body of the text yeah bob is half covered up and half not covered up Oh, I have, I'm, I'm I'm doing a I'm I'm doing a, a scratch board here this morning while oh. I'm listening. So, okay. okay. Anyway, well, we're just just yakking away. <laughs> well, I I got my uh, my dog, sixty two pound dog, in. Oh, oh good. Interesting weekend. Is it and behaving? This morning. He doesn't like to go out because the neighbors look like they're digging a pole, and he doesn't oh. like the loud machinery. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. So every every hour is something new. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but he'll be good. He's sleeping by my bed. And, okay, uh, I'm sure he doesn't like that at all, right? No, he doesn't like that. Looks like he's <laughs> he's uh, he's seven and a half, so he's he's had history with some other folks. Okay. And I'm just having to. I've I've done lots of rescue in my life, and I owned a top winning show kennel uh, that had uh, was mostly miniature schnauzers, and then we had a couple of giant schnauzers. So, uh, but rescue yous, you just never know what their history is, even though you get the best history you can when you adopt them. Right. Well, however, I've, my experience with rescues has been extensive also. And, yeah. and, and uh, I've, I've noticed that they seem to appreciate a new home that's caring for them. And they know that. I mean, they know that when they walk in the door, that the new... The new master is going. Her mistress is going to uh, is going to be good to them, <laughs> and, and so uh, and they take advantage of it. <laughs> this one is has done well so far. He's a little bit too much interested in my eighteen year old cat, though. Oh, so we're gonna have to work that one out, or it will be a lot of management <laughs> more than I care to. Do. <laughs> Didn't you tell me you had a lakey? I have a lakey right now. Yes, in fact, you that's what I'm doing. That's what I'm doing the scratch board of her. Oh, very good. I did, good. A, I did a, uh, a painting for my son and daughter-in-law for Christmas of their Morky, and it's interesting how, I mean, the, it. If you didn't know, you wouldn't know the difference between the two. The only difference is that the the Morky's ears are longer and more fluffy. And my little Lakey, I mean, her ears are perked up like lake cones are supposed to be. And sure. um, but, however, the color is identical. Mm. I mean, <laughs> the reddish so, black, huh? Uh, no, no, these are both blonde. They're both blonde. blonde. Yes. Oh, because you uh, you probably clip her. Uh, yeah, well, I clip her, but but uh, you know, you can tell when they start to grow out. That she has a little bit of brindle in her in her. 
but mm -hmm. uh, but not very much. And it's interesting. I was watching. They had a show that they they broadcast. Uh, I don't know what that. Well, I'm a member of the Lakelands or Lakelands Rock uh, group on Facebook, and they posted a, a show. And there was uh, best in best in class uh, proceedings, and there was like maybe eight or nine Lakeys that are lined up waiting to be shown. And every single one of them was Brindle. <laughs> not a single blonde, not a single uh, bicolor or tricolor in there. Just they're all the, I mean, they look like, look like somebody just took a picture of one and then put it. <laughs> <laughs> Replicated it. <laughs> well, that sounds good. Yeah, yeah I've, I've, I've just about in my entire 72 years had dogs. So uh, we went down Friday and, and kind of interviewed this guy, except he ended up interviewing us. <laughs> and I came home with me, so I've got him for 14 days on a trial basis. Okay. And he's already been out. Let's see, his little, the short history is that he got turned in. He had a four or five year old kid. Then they had a surprise pregnancy. And then they, the adults turned him in, which I can't understand, but you know, everybody's different. And um, so he had been at the shelter for about seven, eight months and out twice already on um, 14 day foster trials. So uh, when I took him, I, I knew, uh, oh, I've got a master's degree and, and it's mostly, uh, primate behavior, but I, it carries over into dog behavior and cat behavior and kid behavior. <laughs> speaking, of behavior my... speaking of behavior, what? I'm going to break in. I'm going to start class now. Yeah, go right ahead. Hey, We're Chloe. We're having a playful conversation. Just go, just go away. Just go away, Charles. <laughs> I know. I know. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, good morning. It's... Uh, for those of you who are unaware of it, it's actually Monday morning, and uh, you know, I guess you did know what day it was because you're here and you you clicked on the screen. Hey. To get here. So, um, speaking of links and things like that, uh, have all of you been receiving uh, emails from the Benson Center um, and and getting emails or links? On a weekly basis for classes and stuff. No. Yes. Well, I don't, but I, I don't deserve it. No. I have, and I've also been getting some phone calls. Okay. I've get, gotten phone calls, but not um, not even weekly on those. Okay. And Elon, I don't, you're, get, I don't get anything. You don't get I got, I got an email asking me to verify my contact information, and I did. Okay. So I do get it weekly. Did do you get so. the things from Sabrina on a? It usually comes out like Monday, and she'll. Yeah, you know, I, 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 I get that. I haven't checked this morning, but I I, I, I do get that. I'm just checking out and see. Okay. All right. So I, Elon, don't, I don't get it. Yeah, Elon. Um, I'm going to pass your name on to Sabrina, but it would probably be a good idea if you want to receive that stuff. Uh, for you to call the Benson Center and talk to either Ron or Sabrina or Sharita and, you know, basically, you know, tell them that you haven't been getting the updates on classes and stuff. Yes, no? I, re yeah, I received mine this morning, Charles, uh, um, yeah, this morning for the week of January 31st. Okay. All right. So, Elon, you know, like I said, just uh, I, I will send an email to Sabrina to let her know that. And, uh, you know, all you basically have to do is, if you'll call the center, you know, and tell them that you're not getting the updates, then they'll get you on the list for that, okay? And Bob? I, I'm, I'm an out of county person. So the Benson Center is, is I, I, would ne I would never attend uh, those events. I mean, the, you're, yeah. you're my only contact here this point yeah. I'm a hanger on <laughs> yeah um, though you know at this particular time you know because of COVID stuff like that I I don't know that they have any restrictions 
Uh, and they've never really had any restrictions about people being out of county, you know, <laughs> a member. At the mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, so, I mean, you could still call the center and get on the mailing, I think, if you want to. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I'll, mm -hmm. I'll ask her about that and I'll get back to you about, you know, how they're, how they're handling stuff like that right now. Just, you never know, <laughs> you know. I just don't want to be kicked off. That's all. I'm have, I'm enjoying this. <laughs> oh, you won't be. Yeah, you won't be. Yeah, yeah. That's that's the least of your worries. Okay. Um, at any rate, we're gonna we're gonna jump into this. Um, let's see, we've got eight of you here. Okay. Uh, right now, um, a couple of weeks ago. Okay. Um, and it's before we looked at Vigi Lebron. Um, we were talking about, you know, uh, painting, you know, approaches to painting. And one of the things that we talked about was this idea of what we call open or broken paint packages. Okay. Now, you know, basically if you, if you begin to look at paintings historically, really up until probably about the, you know, 17th or 18th century, uh, when you look at a painting, uh, pretty much so what you'll see is where the artist took a brush and they filled in a shape, right? Say it's a piece of clothing or somebody's face or something like that. They would put down a layer of paint. Uh, of, you know, could be almost any color or value. Generally, it was a little bit darker uh, if they were painting in oil. And then what they would do is they would then take uh, other colors and values and paint into that, you know, and begin to do what we call model the form. Okay. But it was treated very much so as, you know, just a block of color. And then you would create a gradation or, you know, a, uh, you know, a, some kind of modification of the color, you know, across that shape, right? And, um, you know, again, it's, it's called modeling or rendering. And that's pretty much so classical academic painting in a nutshell. Um, then around about the late 1700s, early 1800s, um, artists, you know, particularly oil painters began to experiment with what we call optics, right? And optics basically meaning, you know, just the appearance of the surface, right? And they began to make observations about the fact that if I take, and rather than fill in, you know, this shape with, a color and then take and create gradations and things like that by adding, you know, wet paint into it and modeling it. Uh, instead, if I just take my like two different colors like blue and yellow, and I began to put little paint strokes down, you know, in that area, uh, depending on how many blue strokes and how many green strokes, I can create the color green. Okay, uh, because what happens is that, you know, the colors optically mix, right? And this is what we call, you know, basically, you know, using broken uh, color, um, you know, a, a contemporary term is what we call an open or broken paint passage, okay? And that's what we're talking about today. And we're, we're going to talk about some artists who actually use that and I'm going to show you some examples of that and then I've got a couple of videos uh, to share with you where people are sort of demonstrating that process okay and again I just want to keep in mind you know it's a very different process of painting than the traditional you know approach to painting uh, it's a more contemporary uh, process and when I say contemporary when you look at, 
most working artists today, um, a lot of them are, you know, basically relying on the science of optics and the use of color, you know, to begin to create the illusions and the images that they're creating. Okay. So I'm going to share with you. Uh, this is just, okay, we got a, a question here. It's uh, how does this style broken uh, compare to pointillism? Um, well, it compares just fine because actually pointillism is one of those particular styles as well as impression, impressionism where you're using what we call open or broken paint passages. Okay. Um, those were actually, you know, well, impressionism, which pointillism is part of was actually one of, the, well, probably the first major art movement to begin to use it, okay? Um, and that's why their paintings were so different than, you know, the paintings, you know, in the Salon at the Academy, okay? So let's take a look at this. All right, so, uh, so here, Everybody see a big block of color? Yes. Okay. Yeah. What color, yeah. what yeah. color is it? The green. Greens and, and yellow. The green. Well, yeah, it basically, it basically looks green, right? Mm -hmm. You know, but it seems like to have some blue lines or something through it, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It reminds me of a piece of cloth. Yeah, but it's it's basically just you know lines of blue and yellow, mm -hmm. and you know where the where the yellow overlays the blue field, uh, and it's just like one layer. You know, it basically optically mixes because the color, you know, when they laid it down there, was sort of translucent or transparent and so it really turns green but the more layers or the more those yellow bands intersect the closer to you know pure yellow it becomes okay. um, let's see now everybody see a little green spot mm -hmm. yeah. growing yeah same same square you know basically done kind of the same way, you know? And so when you back away from it, you know, it reduces down to looking like it's green, right? Um, you know, no real mystery there. You know, that's kind of what's going on is that you've got a bunch of, uh, you know, yellow and blue dots, you know? But optically, if you, if you back away far enough, you know, you begin to optically see green there. Now you can do this with other colors. You know, it's not just, you know, yellow and blue. You can do this with any combination of colors. You can use it with two colors. You can use it with four colors. You can use it with, you know, three. Um, you know, the, the more colors that you begin to add together, you know, the wider range, you know, and variation you're going to get. So here are a few examples of painters who used, you know, what we call open or broken paint passages. Now this is uh, Child Hassam. He was an American Impressionist. And when you begin to look at this, this looks a lot like a pointless painting, doesn't it? It does. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you begin, you know, you begin to see where he introduced, and this is very pixelated. I wish we could actually get a really good high res image of this, but, mm. you know, he had a variety of colors, you know, in these areas um, to kind of create that illusion of that particular yellow or green or blue. And optically, you know, when you begin to back away from the painting, see, it, the colors begin to affect each other. And, 
you know, they, they work in changing not only the perceived color, but also the intensity of, of the color and the value of the color. Um, almost, almost looks iridescent. Yeah, and one, one of the things about using what we call open or broken color like this is that, you know, artists observed that by using different combinations of colors in these areas, they could create this, you know, vibrant, more intense look to the color than if they had just mixed it and slapped it down there. Um, it's that interplay of those direct complements uh, that really, you know, make this work, you know, because of the contrast. Uh, here's a, another example, okay? Now this, yeah. you've never seen this guy's work, you know, this is Vincent Van Gogh, right? But Van Gogh's work was, you know, full of, you know, what we call open or broken paint passages. Okay. You know, that sky is not really just yellow. You know, it's yellow, but it's maybe got a little bit of green in it and you know, other things. Um, Ochres. So, you know, each, each of these combinations of color optically, when you step back away from this painting, begin to create, again, you know, slightly different shifts of color, value, and intensity, and temperature. Uh, here's a Renoir. Okay. That's in Venice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Doge's Palace. Yeah. But again, you know, looking at this, you know, very open kind of broken paint passages. Now, you know, did he sit and just make little lines or dots? No, you know, use brush strokes. Uh, and notice that because he's got, you know, all of these different size brush strokes, um, like in the sky, for example, you know, there's a lot of really small brush strokes there. And these slight little differences in direction and color kind of imply movement, you know. Uh, the same thing with the buildings, you know, these were not painted in as a solid block. You know, there's yellow and white, and probably orange and red and all kinds of other colors, you know, to make, you know, this particular perceived color. Uh, the same thing happens in the water and along the shoreline. But you know, we've talked about this before and notice both at the top of the sky up here and also in the water down below, how the paint strokes begin to get larger. See, you begin to actually see the paint stroke, you know, more in these areas than you do really here in the center, right? How they get very small. Can anybody give me an idea why, why he would do that? We talked about this before. The, the illusion of coming forward. I'm sorry, what? I give the illusion that that's coming forward, or that's close to you. Right. Yeah. Yeah, because as these as these individual paint strokes begin to get bolder and larger, they appear to be closer to us, right? You know, as the paint strokes begin to get finer and smaller. Further away. You know, yeah, they begin to see. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's the human. But it, gives movement. It, it gives movement also because mm -hmm. of the directional and the size. Yeah. It gives but, movement to the water and the sky. Yeah, but it's, it's mainly because of the, the scale difference, yeah. you know, the size of the paint strokes. Um, that again, you know, it's, it's working with the human brain and we, you know, our perception is they're all paint strokes, right? 
but because there's bigger ones, those paint strokes appear closer to us. Smaller ones appear to be further away. And so that's, that's something I want you to begin to look at, you know, and particularly like in impressionistic or pointillistic paintings, you know, when they wanted something to recede and go away, you know, they used a pretty small brush, you know, and, and built those colors up. So there's lots of little paint strokes, you know, back in these areas that you would perceive as having, you know, a high amount of detail, you know, so that they recede. Uh, here's a Monet. And uh, Monet actually painted a lot of seascapes. Uh, you know, did a great deal of uh, plein air painting. But you can see that, you know, all, all of those same, you know, approaches, mm -hmm. you know, carry, carry through on this painting as well. See? You know, his cloud. <laughs> And, and all of, you know, his sky. Again, mm, less contrast. You know, the, the paint strokes are generally kind of smaller. They meld together more as he begins to come, you know, to the top of the canvas. The clouds get larger. The paint strokes get bolder. See, again, what that's doing is that's taking that sky and rather than making it look, you know, flat and two-dimensional, it's doing this. It's tipping the, the sky forward and backward, you know, so that it moves back in perspective uh, as it goes to the horizon line. Same thing with the water, see? Again, you know, smaller, um, you know, less distinct paint strokes as you get, you know, to the foreground, you know, very clear, you know, paint strokes, you know, and the scale and the size of them are larger. Uh, another Monet. This is one of his uh, one of his many many haystack studies. And uh, as you can tell, just looking at this, um, he liked to put a lot of paint on the canvas. You know, but again, you know, look at how he used the color, and how much more textural this area is. Okay. And look at all the color involved in it. Now, the he, sky. Mm -hmm. Yeah, now he didn't use just red, yellow, and blue. You know, he liked, he liked to mix his colors. And like in the mountain range, he makes this gray. But what does he make it out of? You know, greens, blues, pinks, oranges, yellows. There's everything in there. Um, the same thing is true here in the foreground, but notice the difference between the two. See, this generally, well, the color is generally lighter in value. Is it more neutral? Not really, okay. Uh, it's warmer in comparison to this which feels cooler, okay. but what's the difference? It's all the same colors, <coughs> but his paint strokes are larger. He has a, probably a higher concentration of blue in, in this overall mixture. Okay. And so using those okay. same colors, he gets a very different effect. I like that. You know? And that's, you know, that's true really all throughout the painting. So, and, you know. Locations near you. How, how, many, how many people have seen a purple haystack? Purple what? At night time it may look that way. A purple what? At night time it may look purple. Yeah, a, pur a purple haystack. Yeah. Oh, a haystack. Oh, a haystack. Oh. Yeah. I yeah. didn't know what it was. Yeah, I don't know about I don't know about you, but you know, when I go driving around the country, you know, uh, those round bales of hay and stuff, for some reason, just don't look purple to me most of the time. 
That's because you're in the daytime. <laughs> well, I'm in the daytime, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm probably not doing any mushrooms or anything like that, you know, to help my, <laughs> you know, my perception of color or anything, you know, shift or change. But uh, no, I mean, this was at, you know, this was at, you know, either early morning or sunset. Yeah. I would, I would venture to guess early morning because <laughs> of all the yellow in the sky. Um, and what do we know about shadows? Darker. It's darker. It's darker. Yeah, but but if if like for example in the morning you have predominantly yellow light, the shadows are going to be what? Lighter. Purple. Opposite color. Purple. Uh, the direct complement. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So if you if you have yellow light, you're gonna get you're gonna see more violet or purples in the shadow, right? If the light is red, then your shadows are going to be kind of greenish. You know, if the light is blue, then the shadows are going to be orange, right? He's got green in there too. Uh huh. Yeah. He's got green in that purple too. He does. Yeah. Kind of a kind of a. Yeah, with the red that he's got across the middle of the haystack there. Right. Yeah, because yeah. they're direct. They're direct complements, and what are they? Right. Do? Right. They work to cancel each other out and create overall the appearance of a gray or neutralize the color. But you know, when you really begin to look at the color mixtures itself, you know, they're not that neutralized. You know, they're really, you know, pretty strong, you know, pretty intense color. So so again, you know, that's yeah. Yeah, you can get, you know, I mean, and, and again, you know, that's why a lot of contemporary painters and contemporary being from say the early 1800s through to now you know have adopted this process you know for using color and painting because you get to play with those how colors react you know against each other and you can create you know all these beautiful optical illusions that in fact, you can't mix, you know, you can't mix those colors, you know, by sitting down there and adding, you know, green and red together, you know, you're not going to get the same effect as by using what we call an open or a broken paint passage and having those, those colors play against each other. Um, it just doesn't, it just doesn't give the same reaction, you know, to the human eye. Um, and you know, here's my my last example. Now, you know, this is very much so a uh, you know what we might consider a, a pointless painting. You know, lots of little paint strokes, right? Like it. Yeah. But again. You know, as they kind of move to the middle, the paint strokes tend to get a little bit smaller, not as bold, um, not as much contrast. You know, as now he doesn't do it a lot in, in the sky because he, he has a very shallow um, depth on the sky itself because you're only really seeing a very little bit of it. But as he moves to the foreground, see how much bolder the paint strokes get? and larger, again, you know, adding to that illusion, you know, that, you know, the areas here toward the bottom of the canvas are much closer to us than say back here. Helps with the optical illusions. Right. And so, you know, what, what you can do with using paint this way, is is really fascinating really interesting and you know i mean really the sky is the limit you know on what you can do um with this and the contrast and, and the you know just the excitement and the vibrancy of the color in the painting and you really can't get it any other way um so we're gonna 
we're going to look at a couple of videos. Okay. Let me uh, let me close that window so I can get to other stuff. But you know, I wanted you to look at those. Um, Wonderful. So you you know you kind of get an idea of what you can really do with all this stuff. So uh, the first video that I'm going to share with you, it's about 20, I guess about 25 minutes. But, you know, let's see, where are we? Yeah, right here. 1030. Is that what you're saying? Uh, you mean for when it finishes? Yeah. About. No, it's 10.30 now. I, you were saying it says so uh, 25 minutes from now. It, it's like no, no, no. It's, no it's, it, it will take 25 minutes to play. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it's 25 minutes long. Good. Okay. okay. Everybody see some trees? Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. We're all on the same page. That's all, you know, being on the same page is a good thing in, in a Zoom class. It really is. Particularly when you can enlarge the picture so we can see it. But right. There you go. Yeah. Hot dog. Yeah, well, we're going to make it a full screen. And then I'm going to, uh, you know, basically reduce everybody. There we go. So you can see the whole thing. Uh, and we're going to go all the way back. Now, this is, uh, I believe this is Phil Stark who did this video. And Phil. You know, Phil's a very good painter. Uh, he's got a lot of interesting things to say. But, uh, you know, just try to follow along with this. In a painting, too often we start to think in terms of detail. And the definition of detail being a small little value changes, small dark and lights, and we break up a big area into smaller little darks and lights. And the problem with that is we can overdo it real easily and becomes too busy and we lose that overall sense of value relationships between the large areas and we lose the sense of light uh, because the detail takes over. So it, I think it's more important to think in terms of broken color where we have the same value in a large area and very little value change but a lot of broken color and that gives it more of a sense of finish um, with a, just a little bit of value change. And we tend to think the other way. And I think a lot of that comes from photographs because a camera sees everything equally. It'll see just as much detail, little dark and lights in the right corner as it does around the center of interest. So everything becomes sharp, focused, a lot of small details, and that we just lose that overall sense of light. And we tend to think of the camera as reality. So we render what the camera sees and the painting will work. It just doesn't work that way. And I have a few paintings here that uh, show that real well. This is, um, this painting is by John Follinsby, early 20th century landscape painter from uh, Pennsylvania. And you can see in the front here, um, down in the lower right hand in the corner with all the greens and the foliage and the yellow and orange trees, there is a small dark and light detail. You know, a lot of value changes within this area. Same thing in the light area, kind of in the middle down below. Um, and this is up front, the, 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 more, the more detail you have up front, the more it pulls it forward. Um, you don't want to overdo it, but he does have the detail in here. But notice the, the plain and the value and color of the sky, the background trees, and the water, they're all very simple values. One value for the sky, but three or four different colors. He's got bluish green, he's got some yellow, some orange, some pink. And all those colors, it's a very subtle color change because they're all the same value, but it gives it a sense of finish without detail. Same thing with the trees back in here. They're also a blue-green, there's blue violet in there, some red violet, some pink. Um, again, all somewhat very close to the same value. So it's a very subtle color change um, and little or no value change. Same thing with the water. He's got a lot of the uh, warm pink or a cool orange, bluish green, blue, blue violet in the water. And they're all so close in value. It, 
it, it doesn't look busy. Here it gets busy and he does that on purpose to pull it forward. Same thing with the trees, although a lot of the trees, there isn't a lot of value change. There's some, it's mostly uh, color change. Same value, different color. This area right in here, mostly the same, same value and several different colors. And it really has a nice effect. The colors vibrate uh, when they're next to each other, especially warm and cool colors and gives the painting a lot more interest. But what makes this painting work, again, is the simplicity of the larger shapes, especially in the background and in the water, in the subtle broken mm -hmm. color. It gives it a sense of finish. Have a uh, Edgar Payne here. Hmm. Same thing here, a lot of flat areas, flat dark for the trees. Uh, a little bit of broken color in the green, same value, but several different greens, a little bit of subtle value change. Uh, but you can really see it in, the, in the, the, the mountains back in here in the light area. It's got a, two or three different values, but several color changes in here. And both the value and the color changes are very subtle. And they're not big jumps in, in value, not real dramatic. The dramatic value change is in the big shapes between the sky and the darks and the mountains, uh, between the light and dark in the mountains. Um, but the big shapes are broken up with subtle color change. In the shadows here, you can see it goes from the blue violet uh, down to kind of the uh, reddish violet and some orange, caused mainly, I guess, from the, the sunlight hitting the ground here and bouncing back into a reflected light. But nice subtle color change in there. Subtle color change in the light area, the light area in this rock down here in the left, lower left corner. It's an orange rock, but there's there's greens, there's yellow greens, uh, some violets. So a lot of color in there, but he it has still an overall sense of of a uh, real light warm orange color. Very little detail anywhere. No, not a lot of small, little dark and light accents. And it, that makes you focus on the bigger shapes, and then the broken color gives it more re refined, more finished look. Hmm. I have three paintings here by um, Robert Bonneau, American Impressionist, uh, late 19th century, I think, maybe early 20th. But here also, what stands out is the large shapes, you know, the large shape of the sky, large shapes of the three rooftops, the grass, the flowers, uh, the walls on the buildings. Not much small, dark and light value changes, except where you get into the bush, bushes here. And a little bit in the windows and some detail, but most of it, it holds together because it keeps everything simple. But then he breaks up those large areas with color change. A little bit of value change on this roof right here, darker and gradually getting lighter. Uh, but it's the subtle color change that makes it look more finished or more refined. Not the little, you know, he's not drawing every um, little dark and light detail he sees on the roof. You no know, value changes under every shingle. It gives a suggestion of texture and, and finish with the color change. Same value, but several different colors. Same thing with the roots up here from oranges, red violets, uh, even a little bit of green. And in here too, blue, blue violet, some gray orange. So a lot of, a lot of color change, one value. Down in here, a little bit of value change in, in, in these greens. But he's got three or four different greens. Uh, but real close in value. The only detail is, is, is mostly in here, maybe in the windows, um, but everything else is kept very simple. Another one here, um, more of a sunny day, but you can see the broken color underneath the bridge. Um, one overall value, pretty much except for the reflected light gets a lot lighter. Uh, but a lot of broken color in there. And one of those 
especially the warm and cool colors are next to each other, you get a lot of vibration. Even in the white, and this doesn't show up in the photograph very well, but the white building has several colors in it, same value. And with white, there's a lot of color in white on a flat wall and someone's white shirt and white snow. Uh, but it's so white, you have to have so much white in your mixture that um, just a little bit of color gives it a subtle color change and you don't notice it as much because most of these mixtures are, you know, 90, 95% white. And the white really desaturates and knocks down the color. So it's real subtle. Um, you can see it in the uh, shrubbery here. It's an overall kind of an olive green, but there's a lot of orange, yellow green, green, uh, a lot of variety in that one value of green. Same thing with the water down here, uh, broken uh, red violets, oranges within that blue water. So you can see, a, a, a think through a lot of, of uh, detail just by adding subtle color change. This is another Robert Bonneau. Very atmospheric, very early in the morning looks to me, but uh, a lot of uh, moisture or mist in the air. So edges very soft everywhere and not a lot of darks and lights except in the, in the trees and the branches um, in the lower part, but the upper part is just a variety of, of color going from uh, reds, red violet, Blue green, blue violet, a lot of color variation in there. But again, real close to the same, same color. Sky also is kind of a bluish green with a lot of warm uh, reds, oranges in here, red violets. So when we think of finishing a color, I think it's better to think in larger shapes in terms of same value, different colors, and uh, restrict your small value changes to, to just around the focal point. Okay. If you see this plant in your backyard, don't step on it. Uh, this collected plant is more delicious and on. nutritious than most garden plants people care for. If Facebook in their ads. All right. Hey, I wanted to start this video today uh, uh, to, lo to learn about gardening. You have a lot to learn about gardening? Yeah. No, I don't mind to learn. I like it. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah, you'd, you'd be amazed at how many plants out there that people consider to be weeds are actually, you know, very edible and good for you. Let's see. Uh -huh. Let's get back to the class here. All right, let's close that window. Cause we're not so Charles, if you, were going to, if you were going to summarize what that man was telling us, mm -hmm. is, is <laughs> same value, different color, in large spaces. Yeah. Is that right? Is that right? Oh, yes, he was, okay, yeah. He was talking about a variety of painters who painted more or less in the impressionistic approach and they all use that same technique of what we call open or broken color and the thing that made their paintings interesting was rather than just sitting there and mixing a flat color and slapping it on the can pardon me slapping it on the canvas and going okay so there's a blue gray and that's my mountain I still confused now with Rebecca mentioning it, what when you you say I'm talking about, about body value and about temperature. I still okay. still don't get it. All right, well, give me a minute because I'm going to try to explain it to you. So so we could you know we could mix up a a bluish gray for our mountains in the background in the landscape and you know just paint it all in right. Mm -hmm. But what kind of effect does that give you? You know, you see a shape and it has a value. It has a color or a hue. Oh, boy. You know, it also has a temperature, but it's a flat shape. You know, there's not a lot of interest. It doesn't have any real form. 
Um, you know, and you can't get that out of just painting in flat blocks of color. Um, he showed a painting, it was probably the second painting that he showed uh, by an American artist, uh, his name was Edgar Payne. And Edgar Payne did a lot of uh, a la prima uh, plein air paintings. And the one that he showed, you know, was this mountain lake with the mountain and stuff. And, um, you know, a lot of these paintings were done literally within, you know, like two to three hours. You know, that's all the time he had because the light would change. Um, occasionally he would go back and he would set up in the same place and continue on with the painting, but, you know, not real often. Um, so a lot of these were smaller and, and rather quick paintings. And Payne painted in kind of what we would call a, almost like a flat sort of academic style where he'd mix a color block and he'd put in a shape, right? But even he realized that, you know, to get the effects of color that he wanted, that he's gonna have to go back in while that paint was still wet and work into certain areas like the mountains and things and add, you know, more variation between, you know, warmer and cooler temperature colors uh, without necessarily changing the value, okay? Now, to address Armando's question, okay. Can you see my hand, Armando? Uh-huh. How many fingers have I got raised? I think they are five. Five, right, good. Okay, that's your eye test for the day. Okay, and how many types of contrast are there that we as artists can work with? Uh, yeah, five. five. Okay, and what are they? They are fingers. No, no. What are what are the five? What are the five different types of contrast? You know, the first thing is color, right? Oh. You know, what color is it, you know? And we refer to that as hue, H-U-E, right? Hue. Um, and all that means is that it's a member of a particular color family. And guess what? There are only six. Okay? Mm -hmm. There are only six colors out there. Okay. Yeah. Every other variation is going to fall into one of those six color families. Yeah, and, they're mixed. Yeah, and do you know what those colors are? Green, blue, orange, uh, purple, green, blue, orange, purple, no black, no white, uh, red, blue, red, green, blue, orange, purple. I'm missing one. Yellow. Yellow. Yeah, yeah. Simple, simple way of, of saying that are your primary and secondary colors. It's either going to be a primary, one of red, red, yellow, or blue, or a secondary color, orange, green, or violet. Everything you see out there is going to fall into one of those color families, okay? Mm -hmm. Everything, including what you think is white and what you think is black, okay? So it's gonna fall into one of those six, right? So that's the first type of contrast because when you put red next to yellow, they look very different from each other, don't they? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you don't, have a, you don't have a hard time telling the difference between one or the other. You know, but the same is also true with red and orange, which are closer together but they're still different enough and distinct enough from each other that when you lay them next to each other, you can tell that, you know, one has got a lot more yellow in it. One is, you know, pure red, right? And so, you know, that's how you can use color, you know, because you can put those colors next to each other. And though, <clears throat> you know, they don't look similar. And so because they don't look similar, they create a certain level of contrast and they begin to do what we call vibrate, you know, or look more exciting than if you just painted the whole thing in as a solid red, okay? 
Um, so Hugh is the first one. The next one is, anybody have an idea? Value. Value. Yeah, we never talk about that, right? Never. 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 Right? And what is value? The intensity no. of color. No. 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 No, that's not value. Anybody got an idea? The light and dark of it. Exactly. It's how light or how dark the color mixture is, right? You know, it's going to be, you know, it's going to be one or the other. You know, I mean, it could be, you know, what we call a mid-tone, right? But it's either going to be dark, light, or middle value. You know, it's got to be one of those, you know, or some somewhere on the value scale. Mm -hmm. how, how many values can you have? An infinite amount, right? Exactly, yeah. Yeah, you could set up a value scale that has literally millions or billions of ch real subtle changes in value. Um, but for our purposes, okay, uh, for the most part, we have to have a minimum of five values, okay? So that's dark, basically, if we're talking about, you know, black, on the other end, white, and then you have a what we call a mid-tone or gray that's halfway between them. Okay. But then you can find a gray that's halfway between the mid-tone and light. We call that a middle light. And we can find a, a value that's halfway between the mid-tone and the dark called middle dark, right? And so if, if you, in your paintings, will work with a minimum of five values, you can just about paint anything. Just about, okay. So now, what was the fifth, light? Yeah, you got, you got, dark, you got dark on one end, light on the other, mid-tone okay. in the middle. And then you All got right. middle light between mid-tone and light, and you got right. middle dark between dark and mid-tone. Right. That's five, right? Okay. Okay. So, you know, so again, you know, you could do paintings in just five values, okay? and still effectively create what we call these, this illusion of depth, you know. Uh, what else can you create with five values though? Contrast? Well, value. You change skin, 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 skin color, and you, can, and you can change the form of, the, of, ah, of something. Skin that's, that's the word I'm looking for, form. You see, you can create volume and form with just five values. You can turn form. You can make something look round. See? But you have to have five values to do it. You can't do it with three. You certainly can't do it with one or two, right? You need five. You know, five changes in value. Now, does the color have to change? No. But the value does, how dark or how light that color is. And Armando, uh -huh. I know I can, I can see your face and you're like, what's he talking about? You know. If so, I'm painting, for example, a garden, uh -huh. I need to have five different greens? No, uh, not unless you want to make that garden look round, okay? But let's talk about somebody's face, okay? And let's, so, let's mix up a kind of an orangey color for the skin, right? So you're going to need five values to make that head look round. If you only have three, it's going to look kind of flat. Okay. But if you have five values in there and they're arranged properly, then you'll get a three dimensional looking head, even though it's all, all one color, but you have different values. So, you know, value and color, they really don't have anything to do with each other, you know? Um, 
you know, value is a component of color. And, you know, so everything's going to have a value. And it's either going to be dark or light, mid-tone, middle light, middle dark, or somewhere in between. Um, but you, you know, it could be any color, right? It can be any one of those six colors, but you have, you know, you can mix different values of them. Like, for example, you can have a really dark yellow, right? And if you have a really dark yellow, it kind of looks mm, kind of mustardy green, okay? Um, you know, because of how you have to mix it. But again, it'd still be a very dark value, okay? Is that kind of less confusing to you? A little bit. What's four and five? You talked about three, color, value, form. No, I've only talked about two, color and value so far. I thought you talked about form. Well, you need five values to create the illusion of form. Oh, so it's not a contrast? Form, no. Okay. No, form is what you get by the result of creating contrast. <laughs> it's not okay, a right, no. right, right. Yeah, it's semantics, but it's hard hard to put the character. Okay, keep going. You're doing great. Yeah. Okay. So after that, then we have, and Bob kind of touched on it, what we call intensity, right? And intensity is nothing more than how pure the color is. Okay. So when you take a tube of cadmium yellow pale and you squeeze it out on your palette and you take that cadmium yellow pale paint on a clean brush and you pick some of it up and you put it on the canvas, that's as intense as that color will ever get straight out of the tube. If you add anything to it, if you add white to it, if you add black to it, if you add any one of those other colors to it, what are you doing? Modifying it to a lighter value or a darker value. Well, you could change the value, but you're also lowering the intensity of the color. As soon as you start mixing it with something, you're bringing the intensity down. Yes. Okay. I don't care what you put into it. You know, you're still lowering the intensity. Now, obviously, if you take the direct complement of yellow, which is purple, and you begin to put a little bit of purple in it, you're going to begin to lower the intensity of it much more quickly than if you, say, put a color like green into the yellow, right? Anybody know why? You're changing the color with the green, but you're lowering the intensity. All right. All right, go ahead, Gene. I uh, say so you're lowering the intensity, you're graying it down with the opposite color. But if you add the green, the uh, blue, whatever you said, you're changing the color. The yellow, you add the blue to the yellow, you make uh, the green. Okay. You make a different color. Not quite, but you're, you're kind of on the right track. Okay. Because violet is the direct complement, what they do is, you know, the colors cancel each other out. All right. So they become neutral very quick. So if you put violet, with yellow, it's going to have a much greater effect than if you put something that's kind of similar and already has a mixture of yellow in it, like green, for example, okay? You know, and the same is true with orange. If you add orange to yellow, it's going to shift it, but it's not going to change the intensity of it as quickly as if you went directly across the color wheel and put violet in, okay? So, where those colors sit on the color wheel and what they're mixed with, you know, particularly the secondary colors, will affect 
how quickly you're going to shift or modify that color in intensity, um, you know, with your paint mixtures. See? So things that are similar are going to shift it very slowly. Things that are directly across from it, like violet, blue violet, red violet, are going to, you know, modify it and lower the intensity of it much more quickly. You know, it's kind of like, uh, it's kind of like with value. Uh, remember, you know, the first time you ever tried to make a value chart? And you took this uh, big pile of white and you wanted to make gray, right? And so you thought that you could take an equal amount of black and an equal amount of white and get a middle value gray. But what you found out is, mm, no, that doesn't work. You got a very dark gray, you know, if you use equal parts, because mm -hmm. the tinting strength of the black is much stronger than the white, right? And the same thing is true with, you know, colors. You know, some colors have a much, you know, much more apparent tinting strength than others. Mm -hmm. Like for example, blue or violet has a much stronger tinting strength than say orange or green or yellow. Yellow has got the least tinting strength out of all the colors. Yeah. And so if you wanna shift a color, um, <clears throat> you know, depending on what you're using, you may have to use a lot more of one color than the other to get the effect that you want, okay? I, I know that you guys have run into that and trying to mix color before. So that's pretty typical. So that's intensity. Right? And the next thing is the thing that really baffles Armando, which is called temperature. Okay. So what do we mean by temperature? Well, if you look at the primary and secondary colors, right, on the color wheel, you could say, you know, as an abstract concept that red, yellow, and orange are warm colors, right? Mm -hmm. You could. Mm -hmm. okay. So a chili pepper is hot, right, Armando? A chili pepper is hot. And a stream is blue and it's cold. But chili peppers are often green. Well, yeah, but it's I'm, red. I'm just trying to use um, physical temperature, hot and cold, maybe to help it. Okay. Well, <laughs> the fact is, okay, you know, um, any one of those colors, you know, red, yellow, or orange, could in fact be cooler than a color it's next to. Could be, okay? It would be hard because they tend to be warmer than other colors on the color wheel, you know, but, you know, it depends on how it's mixed. But you can, you can modify the temperature of a supposedly warm color to be cooler than something it's being compared to. Um, just like you can take blues and greens and warm up the temperature of them so that they're warmer than what you would maybe think is typically a warm color. Um, so you really can't make a, a definitive, this is warm or this is cool, you know, on the color wheel. It, it's always a conversation of comparison. Right. You know, it's warmer than what right. it's sitting next to, whatever that is, okay? Yeah. Or it's cooler that and really the same is true with intensity you know uh with temperature and intensity it's always a conversation of comparison you know you're comparing one thing to another okay so just keep that in mind um you know and when you isolate that color you know all by itself and you try to describe it you know, it might be a cool color, but it might look warmer than the things around it in a painting. So. 
Or you got all the blues, and some of the blues are, are a lot colder than some of the some of the, excuse me the, the darker blues are a lot colder or cooler yeah. than the, the the lighter blues. So I mean that's that that's a reign of that right there, like phthalo blue, ultramarine blue, cobalt, <coughs> cerulean, etc. You can go down the line. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but if you look at like a phthalo blue, right? Uh, and you compare that to an ultramarine, or let's say a cobalt, okay? Um, because when you look at the, you know, color and analyze it, you know, on the spectrum, cobalt blue and Prussian blue are the two blues that you can go out there and buy that are what we would call spectral blues, right? They're not shifted toward the red or toward the green. They're really, they're pure blue. Now, if you buy an ultramarine, what you're buying is you're actually buying something that's very close to violet because ultramarine blue has a lot of red already in the mixture of it, right? Um, that's why when you try to make greens and stuff out of it, it kind of gets these muddy looking greens. See? Um, you know, and not these real bright, vibrant greens. Um, and that's because again, you know, it's got a lot of red, you know, in the, uh, in the actual mixture of the paint. Um, and then, you know, you look at a color like cerulean, you know, and or phthalo, and those tend to be shifted more to the mm -hmm. side, right? Um, what side? Green. Okay. Yeah, they're kind of blue greens. And so if okay. you look, if you looked at those ranges of blues all by themselves, right? You know, the phthalo and the cerulean would be considered warmer in temperature than say a cobalt or a Prussian blue, which is warmer well, I'm sorry, which is not warmer. It's actually cooler than an ultramarine. And why would ultramarine be considered warmer than a cobalt blue? Because it has red already in the mixture. Red tends to be what we think of as a warmer color, right? Mm -hmm. Ah, so you see, you know, you've got an example of five different blues there you know, a couple of them are warmer, a couple of them are kind of spectral, pure blue, and then a, which is cooler. And then one of them, you know, in the case of ultramarine is warmer than the cobalt. So it's comparative. So. So the spectral cool blues is cobalt and what? Russian. Are Russian. you Russian or Prussian? Prussian. P R U, you know, like P in front of Russian. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So if you take white and you mix white with Prussian blue, it's always going to look blue. It's never going to look purple or pinkish or greenish. It's always going to look blue. If you do the same thing with phthalo, eventually it's going to look green. You know? And particularly when you get a lot of white in it, it's going to make this really, really beautiful pale green. You know, um, if you do the same thing with uh, ultramarine, you know, as long as you've got a lot of the ultramarine in there, it will still look bluish. But when you start getting a lot of white in it, it will get almost kind of purple. You know, make a very like very light lavender color to it. So. You know, it's like as you mix these down, you know, you begin to see the components of the color be more uh, prominent. So, so just keep that in mind. You know, that's, you know, colors have temperatures and, you know, and, and they're not universally warm and they're not universally cool, even though we kind of abstractly talk about, you know, warm side, cool sides of the palette, it's always comparative. You know, it's warmer than this, it's cooler than this, okay? And then what's the last type of contrast? 
uh, Rebecca. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm muttering. I don't know. <laughs> I should know, but I don't know. I apologize. I know. No, you're right. I know. Now you form intensity temperature. No, no, no. Oh, yeah. Take color value intensity temperature. Color right. value intensity temperature. Right. It's the hue value, value. intensity temperature. Those are the four we've covered so far. Right. Okay. The final one, and you guys never. You, you're always forgetting about it. Value intensity yeah. and? It's hard and soft edges. Oh, there you go. Okay. Oh, I missed one. Hue, value, intensity, and? Temperature. Temperature, okay. And the then one you hard, don't like. <laughs> and then hard and soft edges, okay. Hard and soft edges. So why is that a contrast? Well, the fact is, not. you know, if you, huh? I said it's something is very sharp or something is not or so, it's a very soft, subtle, right. which will be further away in the, in the, 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 the darker, or the stronger this color will be closer to you. Well, the stronger the edge. The yeah. Edge. Right. Yeah. The, edge. yeah. If you paint a figure or, you know, somebody's face, and all the edges are very crisp and hard. Uh, so. it, tends, it tends to look kind of flat. But as soon as you take a brush and you start blending some of those edges together and, you know, pulling, you know, making these transitions, these softer transitions, mm -hmm. all of a sudden it begins to take on form. See? <clears throat> but as long as you have hard edges everywhere, you know, the painting's going to look flat. So be that's where uh, Yeah, Quinn. No, I was just saying that that's where Rebecca gets her form. Yeah. Right. What? Huh? Well, yeah. It was a joke. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't catch it. I was too busy writing. <laughs> I know. Me too. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, basically, yeah, those edges in the painting. Um, they'll, they'll either push something back, you know, in the background or they'll help pull something forward, you know, so they'll help give you or create the illusion of depth and space. And that's why edges are really important. See? They also help you as an artist direct the viewer to your focal point. Because your focal point is going to be where the harder and sharper edges are. And the areas that you don't want people to look that are kind of in the background, you want to keep the edges soft. Mm -hmm. no. It's also, I think, that the thickness of the edges that make a difference too. What does that mean? The thickness, the of, thickness of, the edges. of the edges. Thickness or thinness. The, yeah. edges. the thickness and the thinness of the darker edges. Right. So Charles, the man in the in the um, video kept saying. Uh, lots of value changes in an area and then he would say but little no some value very little value changes but some color changes yeah so what he was talking about is a description of his idea of what he considers detail okay so just write the word detail okay and how you can tell that a painting or an area in a painting is detailed is by the contrast in value. So if you see a greater variation in value and sharper edges, then it's going to be a detailed area. That's what he meant when he said, look at the, uh, there was a picture that was, uh, yeah. not, I'm not going to say vague, but it had a window up there and the, and the window was very sharply drawn, drawn yeah. and everything else was just big blotches of color. Right. Yeah. So, so in that particular painting, the artists use the value contrast, you know, light and dark, 
right? As well as how crisp he laid down the edge of the paint to create this illusion of detail. Okay. All right. So is everybody I just wanted to speak in art language and it's, you know, it's like learning a new language. Right. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you, yes. You have to get these terms right in your head so that right. you can talk about them. You know, uh, yes. Yeah. I think in the future, not right now, I need, I think we need you to go again on this thing. It's real on one class to, you know, assimilate everything. We need to continue, you know. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just out of curiosity, okay, for many of you who have been here over the last two years, how many times have we had this conversation? It's usually it's usually at least three to four times a month that I <laughs> that I that I go over the five types of contrast. At least, you know, minimal. Almost every time when you see a picture and you you've explained it, it it's with the, the values and the contrasts and and the and yeah. etc. Yeah. Yeah, so Charles, it will it will help us after we have drawn something or painted something to go back and look at our drawing and painting and then say, identify the color, the hue, identify the value, the intensity, the temperature, and the hard and soft edges mm -hmm. to tell the audience what it is you're trying to tell them from your drawing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. How you're going to get them to focus on a particular area of your painting you know, and create the illusion that you want. So, yeah, you, you have to understand those five types of contrast. If you don't, you know, and believe me, I, I can absolutely guarantee you, there are so many artists out there today painting, you know, and selling work in galleries who don't have a clue about any of those. None, zero, okay? And you can look at their work and you can tell, <laughs> you know, that they don't understand those basic simple concepts. Yeah. So, you know, what, what we're, what we're talking about is, you know, how can you as an artist, you know, practicing this skill called painting, you know, how can you make yourself a better painter, and be more effective, you know, at trying to create the images and say the things that you want to say, you know, with your artwork. You know, believe me, you know, if I can get you to understand and thoroughly be able to use just three of these, it will literally change your ability to paint, hands down, and make you a much better artist. You know, even if you don't understand, you know, two of them, okay. But the really big important ones out of everything, if I had to prioritize how important they are from one to five, I would say value is number one, okay. That's the one you absolutely have to understand because if you don't understand value, you're never going to get anything to work. After that is intensity. Well, actually, no, I want to change that. Okay, so, so the first one would be value. The second one would be hard and soft edges. That's the second most important. After that is intensity. After that is temperature. And after that is hue. You, hue is actually the least important out of all of them. Funny. Okay. Because the fact is, you know, I could paint a portrait of anybody's face. In green. In any color. And if I got the, the value, the edges, and the intensity, and the temperature right, 
it would look just like them. Okay. You know, because I don't need color to do that. Because the fact black is, pardon? You could use, use black and white and do it. Right, yeah. Yeah, you could use any color or any combination yeah. of colors, yeah. right? Yeah, you could, make, you could make their face pink and purple and green and everything else. And again, if you got the value yeah. structure and the temperature and, and the intensity right, it'll look just like them, okay? Now, does, you know, people worry about color, you know, almost universally, they worry about color the most. And it's the least important out of anything we're talking about. Seriously, it is, you know. Now, let me ask you this, why is it the least important? For most people, they want to match the colors in their room and it's very important to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But not to the artist. Yeah. But if you think about color, what is color? You know, you could take any object, right? Like you could hang a white sheet on your wall and then just sit there during the day. Reflective color. And watch, watch how the colors change in that white sheet. Because as the light changes, it's going to affect the color. You know, it's gonna affect the value, the temperature, the intensity. It's gonna affect all of that. Okay? Because color is only a function of light. You know? And if you, if you, you know, depending on the time of day that you paint something, like in the morning, you're gonna have yellow or warm light. In the middle of the day, it's gonna be bluish light, cool, and then in the evening, again, it's going to be warm light, but it, instead of being yellow, it's going to be red to violet. So, so light changes everything, you know, as in regards to color, you know, and that's why color is pretty much so, when I say that color is irrelevant, I mean that, <laughs> you know, it really is. You know, yet it's, it's the thing that, you know, anybody beginning to paint, that's the thing they pull their hair out about. It's like, you know, I don't understand color. You know, if you understand that there are only six colors, that's all there is to know about color. That's it. Okay. You know, it's going to be one of those six. It's, it's going to be an orange, it's going to be a yellow, a red a blue, a green, or a violet. It's gotta be one of those six. Can't be anything else. So, all right, anyway, we could, we could continue talking about this forever, but <laughs> we need to watch another video, okay? Of which I think will be, okay, helpful to you, all right? And then obviously we'll have a lot more questions after this. So, uh, let's look at this. Hmm. Everybody see a canvas with uh, yeah. some yellow and uh, looks Call like- it on the right hand side of it. Yeah. 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 Yellow, white, and black or blue as well. Right, okay. All right, so away we go. Okay, now read the title. Okay, OCAD Studio Broken Color. Okay, that's the Online College of Art and Design. Okay, which I know very little about, but you know, I thought that this was a, you know, pretty decent video on the subject, and you know, you're going to hear a lot of the same things. Um, just a sort of one-off lesson. And it's going to be an introduction to the concept of broken color, which can and, be um, developed a lot. This guy is English and he mutters a lot. But it's actually quite easy to implement and it really makes a big difference in the vibrancy of your paintings. Um, so I've got a couple of support documents for this, um, this uh, video. There's 
something that just sort of introduces yeah. the concept of broken colour, which I'll be talking a bit about as I work. And also an exercise sheet so that you can kind of follow along and complete this exercise yourself. <clears throat> but it's fairly straightforward. Basically, I'm um, just in the process of sketching three similarly sized rectangles. And we're going to be looking at different ways that you can lay a colour on a canvas, basically. In this case, I'm just using a, a pad because. Um, which you can use any sort of surface, but we're going to be looking at the difference between creating a flat version of the colour and creating a, um, a laying down the same colour but by breaking it into distinct um, hues. We can create a kind of vi a sort of visual um, vibration of, of the same colour. So when we look at things in real life, we actually see a vibration of different hues and colours and chromas and values all at the same time. In different uh, parts of the scene that we're looking at. Charles, could you turn the sound up just a little? That's it. You can replicate That's it. as loud oh. as it is. So okay, thank you. I think that wasn't used until the late 19th century when the Impressionists um, came along and kind of really implemented it heavily and turned into pointillism and different versions of expressionism and kind of used it as well. But the, essentially, the idea is that if you've got, in this case, we're going to be making a green. You can have a pure green that you've mixed and painted flat on the canvas. Um, but you could also take those pigments that you use. So in this case, I've got a white, cadmium yellow, Prussian blue, and burnt umber because I'm going to be making kind of brownish green. Um, these colors, if placed next to one another across the surface, and particularly if painted into a base color that already contains their mixture, um, will start to create vibrations. So we're going to do those three variations. I'm going to paint one block colour. I'm going to paint another that just uses kind of pure pointillism. So I'm just going to patch the colours on next to one another. Okay, I want to stop you real quick here, okay? And I want to point something out to you. Now, you may not realise it, but what he has here are the three primary colours. How can I say that? White, yellow, and blue. What, what was the what was the the white and the yellow was a cad yellow and this blue was I uh, think Prussian. What was that blue? The last blue. Yeah, this is a burnt umber. Oh, that's burnt umber. Yeah, it's not a blue. Oh. And what is burnt umber? Red. Yeah, it's basically in the red family. It's a very low intensity red. Hmm. Remember I told you colors, doesn't matter what they are, they're gonna fall into one of those six, you know, color families, okay? Any of your browns are gonna fall into either an orange and or a red family, okay? In Burnt Umber's case, it's kind of a reddish, you know, uh, base color, okay? So in fact, you can think of this as red, blue, and yellow, but he has a very low intensity red. Okay. Just wanted to point that out to you. Okay. Thanks, Charles. Is that, is that confusing to anybody? Well, we, I well, certainly did not hear him well, say that. Yeah, well, no, he didn't talk about this being a red, but, you know, but in fact, that's what's going on. Okay. So when we see that, we're, that's what we're supposed to see. We see well, red, are the, even though it's a burnt are, the, are the colors on the bay on the bottom? The the last four colors the same: the yeah. white, yellow, blue, yeah. and the uh, yeah. Yeah, they are, okay. it's the exact same layout. Okay. okay. Why he's why he's repeated it twice will become clear to you in a few minutes. Okay. As he begins to muddy this up. Okay. <laughs> and finally, I'm going to have. Uh, a wet ground, so I'm going to use the uh, pure colour and then paint kind of random patches of the original uh, constituent colours into it. Um, so the first thing we need to do is use these top colours just to mix a brown green or a kind of base brown green. So we're obviously going to use a little bit of yellow, so we're going to pick a reasonable amount of yellow up. And we're going to pick up some green. You can see already that makes it pretty. Yeah. And, and he's going to pick up some blue. And we're going 
gonna put a touch of burnt umber in as well, just to make it a kind of foresty kind of brownish green. I'm using a bit of medium as well. Depends on your surface whether you need medium or not. This is quite using watercolor paper, so it's quite an absorbent surface. You can see if I just kind of keep working across this, blending it all together, I'm going to end up with a, a really flat, even green, quite a nice woody, foresty green. So I just keep blending and blending and blending. I want to get a really nice flat colour. There you go. You can see it's just pretty much a completely flat green that I've made. So it's just a mixture of our uh, cadmium yellow, our Prussian blue and our burnt umber. And while that's there, I'm going to use these top colours. I'm going to mix. Actually, no, I won't do that immediately. I'm going to swap to, so I've been using, using two identically sized brushes. So I'm going to leave this um, flat color brush aside. And um, if you want to be really neat, you want a different, when you're doing this uh, broken color aspect to the painting, you want a different brush each time you pick up a different color. So you'd have three brushes roughly the same size, um, and you'd have one that matches your yellow, um, one that matches your brush and blue, and one that matches your brown. Now, the only thing I'm not sure about with this, I might need to, um, what I think I might need to do is just lighten the blue and the burnt umber a bit to get it to a value closer to cadmium yellow. So if I start just putting little spots of the cadmium yellow over the surface, just randomly. So I don't want too much rhythm to this or too much regularity that can be a sort of Sorry. Goodbye. What I want, didn't want to do. So you see the uh, that Prussian blue is a little bit too dark to kind of visually mix with the uh, yellow. So I'm going to just tone that down a bit with a little bit of white. So let me ask you guys who have painted with me before. How many things has he done so far that would really just, you know, irritate the hell out of me? Any? Right. Cool. Pardon? Just being a flat color. No. no. No, but look at the way that he's using the brush and how he's dipping oh. a dirty oh. a dirty brush into like these very clean piles of paint. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That that would get me a little pissed off. Um yeah. there's there's a tool called a palette knife. Yeah. That would be really useful here if he would take a palette knife and pull some white, some blue, and then mix it off to the side rather than contaminating, you know, the whole, the whole thing. thing. Yep. Yeah. I've noticed that. Yeah, because now when he wants to go back and modify, you know, say make this lighter or whatever, if he goes back in there with a brush, you know, more than likely he's picking up more blue than he is white. So he, he's not gonna be able to lighten it very much. So, you know, just keep in mind, you know, your working habits, can make this a lot easier for you, okay? Is this oils he's painting? Um, I'm not really sure. I'm I'm thinking it is. It could also be acrylic. Um, well, that's what I was wondering, but it would dry out mighty fast. Yeah, yeah, and on paper like that, it would dry it out really quickly. You know, more than likely, this is oil. So, okay. but yeah, I don't really know. So. Okay.
So if you look closely at pointillist paintings, um, this is pretty much what they look like. So loads of little tiny strokes or dots of color. It's got quite a lot of those blues there. Just another clean as much blue as possible and then start with the yellow so work my way across the surface and then we just want to kind of go through and fill every last bit of white Oop. See, he no longer has yellow. Now he has green. <laughs> so you'll get a little bit of natural mixing as you go. So we can keep dotting over. Yellow as well, and just squeeze some more out because I'm running out of pure yellow. And I wonder why. I don't want the colors to become too mixed because then it already becomes a bit like the third one that we're going to do. Just wanted to make a version of it that's just pretty much totally distinct. And you can do this with any colors that you like, so you can pick any combination of colors and see what it looks like if you mix them. So you could pick a blue and a red and make something purple. Starting to fill in the white here. If you wanted to keep, keep them completely discreet, you'd have to do them in separate days because otherwise, you would get some blending as you work your way across. Go back to this blue. <laughs> See that if you blur your eyes, you start to form a green, and it's obviously pretty uh, exaggerated the pointillism in this one. Um, but if I switch to manual focus, you can look. If I move the focus, you'll see that it starts to. This is essentially what happens when you um, when you move back from an image. Um, if I can really blur it, you see that they just kind of merge because the 
the yellow and the blue start to build in together. Um, and that's what would happen if you, if you took a step back from the painting, your brain wouldn't be able to quite distinguish between the yellow and the blue. There, I mean, even here it's pretty obvious, but we're going to make another one just now, which will be a lot more... Um, A lot more subtle. It'll still it'll be kind of a mixture of the two, so it won't be won't be as flat as this top left hand one. It also won't be quite as uh, I guess harsh in the pointillism as our right hand one. The other thing I didn't do, which I could do, is start to add some of those browns in. So we could then add another element to it by mixing a few dots of that brown. And then that would start to merge with a distance um, with the yellow and the blue. So we start to capture that kind of foresty brown. So you can maybe see that starting to happen as I add those little splotches in. And that's something else that you can play around with. Um, what it's great for is just adding a bit of interest into your kind of fields of color. It works in abstracts as well, but it's a really good uh, method for abstracts. <clears throat> so what I'm going to do now is just mix another see how much paint we've got. Not quite enough. Underestimated how absorbent this watercolor paper would be. So we have enough blue. So like a bunch more of this yellow, cadmium yellow one. That's a bit of blue in. Try to keep it reasonably wet. The water compact is absorbing color at a pretty rapid rate. And then add a little bit of burnt umber into the base. So what I'm doing now is <clears throat> I'm making a wet base by painting. And over that, we just start breaking. So within that, we start to paint. And if you're painting into a wet surface, you'll sort of tone down the pure color. Start to paint some bits of yellow into it. Just like we did over white, you're just starting with something a bit um, similar to what your ultimate look will be. Equally, you could do this over a, a dry surface, but it's kind of nice the way you get little bits of smudges. It can help to vary your brush direction if you're doing something a bit less regular looking than that. So pointillism tended to use the same brush strokes, but if you're working in a more classical and you just want to kind of subtly create a bit of vibration within your painting, um, I recommend um, kind of doing brush strokes in different directions. So you can add a few bits of brown as well. So that brown, one thing to look for as well, the brown is maybe a little bit too dark for the base color. So that's why I can add a little bit of white into it. And there you can see the values closer to the original uh, color. So all that we're starting to shift is the hue and chroma, but not the value, which means our brain reads it as the same value, but then can't quite pick exactly what color it is because obviously color shifts the whole way across. So you can see that by doing that, I started to kind of shift that um, kind of general impression of a color to do, to, towards yellow brown. But I mix up a bit more blue, the right value. Start painting that in. Okay, so I want to. Everybody look at the three rectangles that he's painted so far. Okay. Which ones have more interest? 
Have more what? Interest. Which ones, you know, kind of catch your eye more? Have to be the, the one on busy the one. Yeah. The what? Yeah. The, the one on the right is so busy. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, because there's more contrast between the various colors, right? Yes. Okay. The one on the bottom has the different values, and the one on top is flat. Yeah. Well, this this is kind of boring, right? Because it's just one flat, continuous color. Right. You know, here you have the overall color, and they're very similar, other than this is darker in value overall, but uh, but they're both green. But this is a more interesting green because you get these little bits of variation in it, right? Yeah. Now here, you know, he's trying to make a green. Did he really do that? Mm, not really. Not well. Yeah. Um, you know, he he could use more. He he could use a little more time paying attention to how he di dispersed the blue mixture throughout, you know, the yellow, um, and that might get him a better effect of it looking more green. Um, now I know he was doing this as a demo; he wasn't taking a long time doing it. But uh, but if you're doing if you're taking this approach, you got to be very intentional about you know how many little blue dots you're going to put in that area and how far away from each other they are you know in comparison to the yellow because otherwise you end up with you know something like this which is really busy yeah you know and that might be you know maybe you want that okay in that case it's fine but you know if you want this to be more subtle and look more like this you're going to have to disperse these a little more evenly so that you get a similar effect because when you squint your eye down this doesn't come anywhere close to that and mm -hmm. the fact is he's going to need a lot more dark blue in there to get anything close to that so but i just wanted to kind of point that out to you but you see you know it's the same material but he's using it three different ways and he's getting very different effects you know with it and you know the one i kind of advocate and use the most is the one that he's working on right now where you've got wet paint down on the surface and then you're going back in and you're modifying it by adding other color into it that's what i was going to ask you for instance the one on the right if he had done a base coat and put in instead of the same values put in a brighter value here and there to to make it would that make a difference? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I tend to be what you call, I either paint in one of two styles. I paint in a traditional style. So I do an underpainting and I build up glazes and then work, you know, areas of translucent to opaque color over it. Uh, and or I'll do a la prima, okay? And if I'm painting a la prima, this is the way I paint. So I'll put down a block of color and while it's still wet, you know, I go back in and I add more color to it till I get it, you know, to look the way I want it to. Okay. Okay. So, you know, generally I would say probably 75 to 80% of the time when I'm painting, I'm doing this, you know, I'm not doing this, I'm doing this and I'm, you know, I'm not definitely not doing that. Okay. Um, though I could take something like this as long as it stayed wet and work over it, and it'd be fine. But this is a wet into wet technique, right? This is wet onto a dry surface. This is wet onto a dry surface. All right. And it does make a difference. Okay. So that's why I say, you know, in oil painting and also in acrylic, you know, you got to put down some paint first, you know, before you can do anything. You know, if you're working into a dry surface, it's really hard to get the effect that you want, you know, because then you're dealing with trying to cover the surface and how much of it and lay the paint in there 
in an interesting way as well. And that's why I always sort of advocate, you know, doing a wet into wet process where you're putting down a bed of color and then you're working into that bed of color with other colors and values and, you know, you're modifying it as you go along. So, anybody got any questions about that? No, but I did want to ask you about how to keep the acrylics a little wetter. They've got a half a dozen different kinds of products and I, and have you tried any of them to know which is the better one to keep the acrylics a little wetter to work in? Yeah. Um, Could you gold, suggest one? Yeah, well, both Golden and Liquitex make what they call a retarding medium. It's called a retarder. And um, when you lay when you lay your acrylics out, um, put you know just a little drop of that retarder into each of the piles of paint and mix it in, and that will extend the drying time of the paint by several hours. Okay. Hmm. All right. Now, and the thing is, you know, you want to be you want to be careful and not put like a ton of retarder in it. Right. Um, you know, it's just a, a little bit goes a long way. Um, okay. but, it will, but it will help keep the paint wet for a good long time. You take each color and put a drop in it and then take like a palette knife and mix it, mm -hmm. mix it up so it's it all throughout, correct? Right. Yeah, yeah. And then, after, and then after that, what I do is I usually when I'm working in acrylics, I have a wet paper towel that's like five or six layers thick that I fold it up uh, across one end of the palette. And it's, it's not soaking wet, it's just damp. And you know, I'll scrape up my color and I'll put the color directly onto that wet paper towel. And, oh. and that will again, keep moisture in the paint and stop it from drying out. Literally, you know, I've, I've kept acrylic paint out for three days okay. without it drying out that way. Okay. okay. So. I'm thinking about trying to buy some and, and try it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. I, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I actually like acrylic paint. You know, there's some artists who don't. Um, but, you know, <laughs> With acrylic paint, you know, it's a catch-22 because, you know, the great thing about acrylic paint is it dries fast. The bad thing about acrylic paint is it dries fast. Too fast, yeah. Yeah, it's just, yeah. It's, is, it, is it a liquid or is it a, 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 is it a retarder, a liquid or a gel or what? It's... Is it like gesso or something in that no. order? No, it's, it's not that thick, but it's it's not like a real thin paper either. It's it's a little bit it's a little bit viscous, you know. So it's got it's almost like the consistency of an oil. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. But again, you know, just a you know, if you put a little of it in a cup and then take an eyedropper or something, just put a yeah. drop right. you know, into you know a, a little bit of paint. You know, right. let's say let's say that you squeezed out you know this amount of paint you know, on your uh, palette. Right. Yeah. Right. Just a little tiny drop into that would make okay. that, you okay. know, last for quite a while, okay. you know. But, you know, my, my thing with paint is, you know, I never mix up small amounts of anything because I, I figure, you know, I would rather, I would rather, Have it ready to use. yeah, I would rather waste a little bit of paint then have to go back and remix the color because if I have to do yeah. that, then I'll never get it like the previous batch. Well, that's right. funny because I, I'd rather not have it like it because I think that's what makes the interest is the difference, the slightly different tones that you will eventually get out of re remixing a color. Yeah, I think but, yeah, but if, you're, if you're trying to go back in and rework an area and you're happy with the color and the value and stuff of it, and you're yeah. trying to match that. And remember, yeah. you're working in acrylics and acrylics yeah. still shift in color, right? So you'll mix up, 
Yeah, you'll mix the acrylic to look exactly like you want it to. You'll put it onto that area and then all of a sudden, you know, it's like 10, 15 minutes, half hour later, after it all dries, it's gonna be darker than right. you originally had down. Right. That's, that's why in particular with acrylics, I would rather mix more paint, right. you know, and, and have a little too much paint than not enough paint. Okay. Yes. So, yeah. and like I said, you know, if you, if you take your acrylic paint and you'll put it on like a damp paper towel, and then you'll put it, um, I use, uh, it's, it's what they basically call a, a, it's a piece of Tupperware. Um, you know, it's plastic. They're about seven or eight bucks. You can buy them in, uh, in Kroger or Publix in the like household section. Um, you know, you get something that will, will hold like a nine by 12 flat sheet cake. Um, and it's got a lid on it. So you mix up your acrylic, you put it on the paper towel, you know, you use a little bit of it. You put that lid on it and, and you know, yeah, keep the moisture in there. And like I said, you know, I've kept acrylic out, you know, for three or four days, you know, without it drying out, you know, that way. Mm -hmm. And still be able to go back in the next day and, you know, just start working and, and not have to, you know, remix things and right. so. So the more you know, the more preparation time that you put into it and planning, usually you can give your you know, huge amounts of time, you know, by doing stuff like that. Okay? Thank you. All right. Anyway, let's finish this up because we're almost at noontime. And I know Armando wants to go eat lunch. You're not the only one. One approach you can take is you can try to have a base color that you're attempting to match. Charles. You can just kind of work. Yes, Richard. Oh, the dark colors on your cell. Appropriate. So you just get your kind of colors up. Okay. So uh, again, he's, he's, and these are repeats, okay? So they're the same colors. But he started off with white, then cadmium yellow, uh, Prussian blue which is a spectral blue, talked about that earlier. And then this is raw umber, or no, burnt, burnt umber. Actually, it looks like a raw umber. Anyway, the raw umber is, is nothing more than a muted red, okay? So he has red, yellow, and blue out there with white. Does that answer your question? There's one more at the bottom. No, the, these are the same thing. Again, he started with white, yellow, blue, and then raw umber. He, he just repeated it. Okay? Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. So they're the same colors. The four up here and the four down there are the, the exact same. He just put... Thank you very much. Okay. So see, now he's mixing the green, you know. So it kind of negates the whole uh, concept there. <laughs> <laughs> you can play around with it, so you can add. It's kind of like, yeah. Kind of brighter little uh, variations. Yeah. You but will he, tend to find, though, that the more... He's got the right concept. He's yeah. just not going about it very, very organized and very well. So all the colors, all the different hues are the same value. So it's the same lightness, darkness. And you can feel around for that. So if I blur my eyes, the yellow sort of stands out. So I could go through, tone down the yellow. I could maybe pick a different pigment as my yellow. So something like a yellow ochre might work a bit better than the cadmium yellow because the cadmium yellow is naturally a, uh, a brighter color. Otherwise I, can have, I would need to go in, so I need to go in and just use the burnt umber to tone down this little, which brings it closer to the blue. Probably still even a little bit, a bit bright for the blue, so I could make the blue lighter otherwise. It's another option, so we go up here. That's a bit closer 
to my yellow. And again, it's about to shift the overall impression of the color. So you can just sort of work backwards and forwards as you like, but it's particularly wet into wet. Um, you'll notice it just gives, I blur this now. If I blur that, you see blurs to a pretty similar color to the original one that we we're working on. They're sharp enough, and you see the individual things emerge. And that's what you're looking for. So, kind of a normal viewing distance would maybe blur it into this sort of level, um, and it's just just more interesting to look at, um, which really adds a lot of life to painting. So, particularly landscape paintings, um, you can you can use it in any form of painting. So, I, I would do it in the shadows of still life objects. You can do it with. Um, paintings that are of objects of any colour, so even working in white I will use broken colour because um, white can be can look grey unless you break it, so very often white kind of has a full spectrum of colours going on inside it, um, which is scientifically what white is doing as well. And it just makes that the painting of white look much more vibrant. And it's something quite, it's quite an easy thing to push and pull backwards and forwards, so if you wanted you could allow this to dry and then do a glaze over both of these would work, so you could turn it down, you could shift it to a different color. So if I did a yellow glaze, say a pure cut yellow glaze, it's become a very greeny yellow, a uh, very yellowy green. If I did a blue glaze, it would be a lot more blue, obviously. Um, so you can always overwork them, um, but it can create a nice vibrant background. So kind of any part of the painting can have a seat that the entire painting can be made of um, these sorts of brushstrokes. And a lot of impressionist work is like that. So there's an example of the haystacks, one of haystack, the haystacks paintings by Monet that I've in the accompanying document. Um, and you can really clearly see uh, the broken colour, uh, how it's working. And it makes for a really beautiful painting. So I recommend trying it. As you can see, it's a really quick exercise, quite fun. Um, you can use any pigments you want. So if you mixed a blue and a red, you get a kind of purpley colour. You can mix yellow and, orange, yellow and red to get an orange. You can use complementary, contrasting colours. Anything <coughs> really. You can just experiment with it, and certainly try to experiment with the paintings. Um, as I say, it really works particularly well for um, landscape paintings because they're very atmospheric. And it's, it's a very atmospheric technique, um, which is the impression is typically very often focused on landscape, and it's in the landscape that you see a lot of these light effects going on. But yeah, that's it. Hopefully that was interesting for you guys. Um, and I will see you soon. Okay. Did he just say he could put a glaze over the one in the right to make it uh, look more uh, closer to the ones on the left? Uh, he just mentioned what, over it. Yeah, what he said is that after it goes dry, he can glaze over any of them. You know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, as as a, I wouldn't say as a last resort, but, you know, as a late stage technique in in painting. You know, once you have your basic colors and stuff down, you need to just modify it a little bit. You know, glazes are really effective at that. That's where you want to use glaze is really at the end of the painting, not necessarily at the okay. beginning. Okay. Okay, um, off to an appointment. Okay, that was Gwen. All right. Um, okay, so anybody got any questions about anything we looked at? Any? Okay, so next time I see you guys submit a painting, you know, it's going to be full of broken and open paint passages, and, you know, you're going to play with, you know, contract and you know, all that fun stuff, right? Where's my resounding, uh, come on. I'm, I'm using colored pencils. Yes. Well, in, in fact, you know, because you're using colored pencil and the way you have to build it up, you're using this technique. Right. Yes, yes, I understand that, thank you. Yeah, because that's what you're doing. You're optically mixing color, right?
right there on your right. paper. But it's not easy to mix color with uh, color pencils. Why is it fun? It's not like when you use acrylic or oil. No, it's not easy. Same. I don't know. Maybe maybe I had cheap pencils. I don't know. Same thing. You know. You <laughs> The, the difference is you, know, you can't take a, a brush and pick up a little of this and pick up a little of that and mix them into a yeah. big pile. But what you're mm -hmm. doing on the paper is you're putting one color down, then you're working back over it with another. And yes. every time you put a basket or a layer of color, you know, you're, you're building more interest in the color. See? So it's not just, just not all green. You know? Mm -hmm. And, you know, even if you wanted to make it all green, you know, how much, you know, how, how many layers you put down and how hard you bear down on the pencil, you can make it a darker green to a, a lighter green. See, so even, oh, with yeah. that, even with that one color, you can create variation. In, in that. If you're gonna use one color on top of another one, oh yeah, you have to do it real hard. No, um, you don't have to do it real hard. You know, in fact, you're better off not doing it real hard you just have to be very patient and keep going over it. Let it build up slowly. If you let it build uh, up slowly, then you'll get some really nice transitions. If you start pressing real hard, then what you do is you take all the tooth in your paper and you flatten it out and you make it slick so you can't put any more on. Oh, I see. So, yeah, you want to be careful with that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Anybody else? Come on, I know there's got to be a question out there somewhere. <laughs> you answered pretty much all the questions. Okay. Maybe Veronica, who has been quiet this morning. Well, I think that some of the things we are, we you've told us before, and and because so. Uh, we don't practice all the time and we forget some of the things that it's just a good refresher. I mean, I would say that that's a one. You know, the fact is, yeah, it's, it's like none of the stuff I talked about today, mm -hmm. anything that you've never heard before, you know. That's correct. Yeah, you've that's heard correct. it over and over and over again. <laughs> But what happens many times when we're painting or drawing, we, we uh, default back to old habits, uh, yeah. things that we know, and forget to keep implementing the new things. Right. And so, so it's a good reminder, you know. But, but yeah, the. the I, I, think, I was going to say, I think too that when we're actually painting or drawing, uh, as you say, if we go back to our old habits, but then when you look at it, you think about the different uh, things we've covered and say that, oh, I'm missing this, or that's why it's yes. not. <laughs> yes, that's true. Well, you know why it's not working. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what they, what they, they say, you know, about, you know, uh, recovery. You know, the first thing is that you have to be able to admit that you have a problem, you know, before you can do anything about it, right? So if you're, yep. aware, if, you're, if you're aware of, you know, the different aspects of contrast and stuff like that, and you look at your, your work and it's missing some of those, then you know what you have to do about it. Mm -hmm. All right. It is. And until you do something about it, it's not going to get any better. You know, mm -hmm. it's pretty simple. Yeah. Do you know? Do you know anything about this new uh, Benson app that Sabrina just sent us? <laughs> you mean the uh, the virtual classes? Yeah, I. It's a no. It's a virtual app for Benson Center. She just sent it. I haven't looked at it yet. Oh yeah. I haven't seen it, so yeah. Okay. Yeah, but I, I think what they're trying to do is is they're they're trying to put together an app so that when you want to register for classes and stuff like that, it's all right there within the app. Yeah, that's that's what uh, it said. Yeah, sort of a 
almost a social media type thing. But I haven't looked at it yet. Yeah, well, I think it's I think it's that, but it's also uh, because they're not doing like on-site dining and stuff like that. I think you can also order meals. Yeah. You can do a variety. Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna check it out. <laughs> yeah, I think it's worthwhile, you know, taking a look at. It. You know, so Charles. Yeah. If you wanted to go to one of the online classes and you see it in the uh, in the schedule, do you have to go and register them for that, or did you, can you just click on? No, I, I, yeah, I, I don't think, you know, just like these classes, I don't think there's a registration process for that. No, they're making it available to you, and if, if you've got the link to it, then I think you're fine to go to it. Yeah, I went to one uh, for gardening, and, and and I clicked on it, and, I, and nobody ever came. I, it just didn't go through, or, or, hmm. or they didn't have the class that day. Yeah. It was a Friday class at, at 10. Yeah. It, was for, yeah. it was for gardening, urban gardening. Yeah, that's, that's, that's Kermit's. Is it? Yeah. Well, I I don't know what he didn't show or, but uh, I went from the information she gave me and I, nothing, nothing. Okay. So did it did it open up a Zoom screen like this? No, not like that. I mean, it, it, well, it it I don't I don't know if the if the um, the number was right. I'll try again and see what happens. Maybe it was just yeah. the next time that they have a class and see. Okay. Yeah, and it may be it may be that you know you didn't have the time right, you know, and so the class, depending on how he set up the class, it may open up and let you into what they call a waiting room, you know. Uh -huh. When I when I structure the classes and I set them up actually on the Zoom app or on the site. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't make a waiting room, and I just yes. keep it open so that people can join as they come. Yes, and, yes. And that way, you know, if it takes me a minute or two to get here, you guys can, you know, have a little bit of social time, you know. <laughs> We've done that before. Yes, yeah, I know. I've never seen that happen before, Gene, ever. Yeah. yeah. But no, that's, that's why I do that, and that way, you know, you're not just lit, you know, sitting there kind of twiddling. Sure. You know, I mean, occasionally, you know, it's like when I open up a class early, you know, I'll be sitting there for a minute or two until somebody comes online. So, you know, it's just a matter of, you know, did you have the time right and, and did the link work? Okay. So at any rate, it's time to go eat lunch. I know that Armando is starving. And uh, anyway, thank you. Uh, <laughs> Armando, what are we? Thank you all for uh, coming. And uh, tomorrow at uh, two o'clock, we got a share session. So if you happen to be working on something, you might take some of the ideas that were kind of presented today and, you know, maybe experiment with them, you know, put them to use, right? You know, it's a okay. wild, crazy idea. Of course, of course. <laughs> Thank you. All right, anyway. Okay. Thank right. you. Well, Have a good day. Bye. Bye. Have Bye. a good day, too. See you. Bye.